within Sussex Humanities Lab, I'm Professor of Performance Technologies and I'm a theatre and performance uh, historian and I tend to have a, a, a terrible habit of trying to rope together the performativity and logics of uh, Greek amphitheatres with uh, 22nd century uh, technologies. Um, so I'm interested in the cusp of art, technology and science, but looking at it over time. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is uh, with this strange title, um, is look at questions of listening, but in a much broader historical uh, context, looking at how musical practices might have been inflected by um, rules and, and, and sequential operations that we qualify these days as algorithmic, but that might be analogously uh, defined also as algorithmic um, in some very, very old traditions. So in Old English, um, this wonderful word, hlisnan, defines, designates listening, hearing and paying attention. And of course, paying attention is something that we value in very different ways. And it's something that can be expensive in very different ways, cognitively, financially, socioculturally. And in different value systems, the trade-off between recognisability, a pleasing to boring upholding of existing habits and practices on the one hand, and surprise on the other, they're exciting to alienating upheaval. This is what makes uh, sonic arts, um, like so many other cultural forms, a rich collision point, a study that can be both forensic and prospective. So this is my hang up. I'm hung up on the past and the future, and I guess I'm somewhere you might call the present. Um, I use the term musicking a lot, which comes from Christopher Small, and musicking designates all activities associated with music making. Um, and I want to see how artists can depart from familiar frameworks whilst ensuring what are hopefully for them and for us compelling legibility of their work for their and their audience's engagement. And I'm interested in how conditioned our grasp of the rules and sequences of operations implied by the means mobilised by musicking means um, how, how this um, conditioning um, operates and this conditioning, of course, includes practitioner and public socialities and expertise. So this, this uh, word here, exosomatic, our techniques and artefacts make up what Robert Innes calls exosomatic organs. Uh, many of you are familiar with the term, others perhaps not. These are often intertwined ways of extending, substituting and compensating for the innate powers of the human body. Innes's definition ranges from simple tools and devices to more complex systems, and he, he includes microscopes, computers, languages, weaving looms, airplanes, and institutions. Exosomatic organs uh, have their own dynamic logics. They have their propensi propensities to evolve and tangle with other physiological, technical, and social organs, making up what Stiegler calls his general organology. And of course, they co-evolve with our perceptual schemata and motor skills. They entrain us to attend to levels of precision beyond our unaided embodied cognition as the primitive biological neural networks that we are. So musicings and tunings, which are our calibrations to given systems, therefore to the scales that are intrinsic to given systems, these imply economies and politics of paying attention. Actually, we have a wonderful colleague at Sussex called Kate Lacey who works on the politics of listening and notably of silence. Um, in Chinese culture, to quote some interesting politics of listening, the foundation tone discovered by Ling Lun, the mythological founder of music, was a specific note produced with a bamboo pipe, and Ling Lun then added 11 others to create a 12 tone system. And he tuned his pipes, obviously, as Dan and Alice know, to bird sounds. Each dynasty had its own proper pitch, which had to be obeyed and that was often fatal not to do so. So this was a kind of what in programming languages would be called imperative programming. And this is an image of the 9,000-year-old um, still playable uh, bird bone flutes, because obviously bamboo was perishable, um, that were recovered from the Huan uh, region in 1999. Um, but I think it's interesting to... Henan province, sorry. I think it's interesting to imagine how these, uh, these flutes with their specific affordances and their solicitations to be played are actually, if you look at them forensically, they're, they're sets of instructions. And they're sets of instructions with which you can play fairly predictable sequences. 
So this is the wider context in which I want to set algorithmic listening, an algorithm being a set of rules that precisely define a sequence of operations. So what do we mean by precisely define? From what point of view and what level of detail? Canonical structures like the proper pitch of dis dynasties or the well-tempered scales of the fugue, um, these might be considered as sets of rules governing precisely defined sequences of operations in musicking. What we de deem a precise, sequentially coherent operation in one context or in one value system might be viewed as incidental or ineffectual in another. Whence the need to work on concrete instantiations. And I think the um, references today to pragmatic um, playing around with stuff is, is, is really crucial. The same canonical structures that shape the evolution of our cultural practices instantiate conventions that some see as existing precisely in order to be challenged and surpassed. Um, Paul's allusions uh, this morning to resistance, ambiguity and chaos as creative resources I think are really crucial in the, in the art world and in the connection between the art world and the developing technology world. I would say that this is a vital evolutionary resource, this kind of practice. It's needed to keep us on the razor edge where predictable and unexpected phenomena can creatively clash. This is the kind of thing Alice is evoking with her echospectralism um, reference. Artistic auditory practices that are complexified rather than simplified, not pedantically complexified, God knows anybody can do that, but creatively, interestingly complexified and that act as trading or boundary zones where we simultaneously savour the elegance, a word often used in judging the functionality of algorithms, um, the elegance of ordered processes that comply with listening habits accrued by paying attention. And at the same time, these are zones where we experience the disruptions to those ordered processes on which evolving cultural dynamics depends. We listen for, we listen to, and we, we revel in creative agility to defy rules. Music involves stretching and compressing time, and repeated macro-temporal patterns induce rhythmic expectations. Culturally shareable pattern resonances. These are terms I'm borrowing from Peter Cariani. And these are the backbone of compositional or improvisational sequences of operations. So the art of musicking implies the invention of resonant new patterns, which evolve with our exosomatic organs, probably starting with manually crafted percussion and breath-carrying instruments, Ling Lun's bamboo flutes, or, or these later editions of them, um, and ranging to machine and computationally engineered tools, synthetic, hybridized, deployed through more or less physically manifest systems. Machining techniques have progressively freed us from the fetters of embodied ergonomics and, debatably, the associated cognitive processes. The lathe, known as the mother of machine tools, which dates back to ancient Egypt, led to the invention of other machine tools in a process that might itself be construed as algorithmic. Again, it's a, it's a question of what perspective and what time frame one chooses to consider these evolutions in. So this image here um, is not actually of a, of a Martian heart valve, although it could be. Um, it's the computer-designed 3D printed valve block that was just successfully trialled a couple of weeks ago on the A380. Um, and the design of this valve block uh, surpasses any possible human modelling abilities. It optimises its, its very expensive titanium power medium. Um, it's got far fewer uh, parts to it, and it's 35% lighter than the human already human computer designed valve. And so we're headed for these, these sorts of exosomatic organs that have outpaced our own projection and modeling abilities. And I think this has been alluded to in many ways already this morning, but I'd like to do it in a much uh, more naive way coming from uh, musical and, and creative practice. And I think that these tools and artifacts generate new understandings of what do constitute the chronological and morphological hallmarks of operating sequences. So our understanding of what constitutes an algorithm and an algorithmic process is, I think, um, something that is being, um, is being boosted, is being, is being influenced by these kinds of tools. So our creative agility is intimately, if not iteratively, tied up with the design of technical artifacts that are part of human listening practices. And, and what I want to insist on is the fact that um, artistic and, and musicking 
type practices, sonic practices, auditory practices in a creative uh, realm are the sources of, of complexities and richness and defiance and resistance that is precisely what's needed in order for us to get away from the path-dependent, purely technologically goal-driven um, processes behind, behind our, our, new, our new resources. And I think I'm to time. Thank you. Just for a short introduction, I'm Shintaro. I'm a senior researcher at the, it's a long name, Institute of Experimental Design and Media Cultures at the Academy of Art and Design within the University of Applied Science and uh, Arts, Northwest, Northwestern Switzerland, which is based in Basel, a um, small town in Switzerland. And my background is uh, media history, but also musicology and uh, philosophy. But I was uh, very much interested for a long time in computer music, so also very much in resonance with other um, computer music practices. So um, one target of my short input within these 10 minutes is to draw your attention to algorithmics, which is a body of research I worked on mostly 10 to 5 years ago, basically featuring the listening culture of the early mainframe uh, computing era between 1945 and 1965. And during these 20 years, machine operators and scientists were listening to their computing machinery, or to, or to be more precise, to algorithms at work and their rhythms. So I called them algorithms written wrongly with uh, R, H, Y, T, H, and not uh, R, I, T, H. Um, I will do that as this is probably what you expect, but also I would like to combine this with some unfinished approaches and alternative views. So as you know, machine listening, uh, as we already heard many times today, uh, is usually understood in relation to machine vision, which is a form of machine analysis based on statisticals or other methods, uh, subsumed more and more under the term artificial intelligence or deep learning or whatever. whatever. And these analytical algorithm-based tools reveal structural differences in the data under study. And in case it is visual data, such, uh, such as picture or maps, you, you call this uh, machine vision. And if it's audio data, then we speak of machine listening. So when we try to grammatically differentiate and play with the two terms, machine and listening, we will get combinations such as a machine is listening or listening to a machine, which provokes also the question, who is actually listening, right? So is it a machine or living organism, such as a human? Are there several agents listening to each other, or is it just one machine? And how are these entities, <coughs> such as users, operators, tools, algorithms, protocols, and so on, related to each other? And what are the interfaces and the mediating elements and modules? So here we have um, squares and circles while squares represent machines and circles humans. And the picture you see is part of a cover of a 1977 grant proposal with uh, the title Graphical Conversation Theory, written by the MIT Architecture Machine Group, the kernel group which later became the MIT Media Lab, um, submitted to the National Science Foundation of the country. So according to Paul Pangaro, a former PhD student of the British cybernetic designer and architect Gordon Pask, who coined the concept of conversation theory. So according to Pang Pangaro, who wrote about the cover in, in a 2012 blog post about Siri and other AI bots, the picture represents people interacting with machines, that's the left side, then uh, talking to each other through machines, that's there in the middle, and then talking only to machines. So for this workshop, we of course could try to further differentiate a little bit and interpret the graphical combination on the left as machine, a human listening to a machine or a machine listening to a human. Then in the middle, machines intercepting a human to human conversation. And finally on the right, several machines does kind of an ecology of machines, both listening to and communicating with human being uh, while at the same time maybe having also a conversation for themselves. 
So, and whether there is a progress between the middle and the right constellation, it's another question, but by going through these possible semantic and conceptual combinations, we might enrich a little bit the meaning of machine listening in um, some sort of productive, or one could also say diffractive uh, way. So that say, I try to now reiterate the first constellation, which is a human listening to machines or machines listening to humans. So, and I would like to focus on the first combination, which brings me again to uh, the algorithmics. So here you see a <coughs> mainframe machine from 1956 called uh, Pegasus uh, from Ferranti, which in, in Manchester. It's not so big machine anymore. It's a kind of a cupboard, huge cupboard. And the question is also from our media theoretical side, where are the interfaces? So we have here an oscilloscope, we have a type machine writing out the data. Then we have also uh, a speaker. And uh, as I worked out in several papers in my dissertation in German, um, several mainframe computers between 1940 and 1956, uh, 65, sorry, had built in uh, loudspeaker amplifier systems uh, to sonify or audify um, computational processes. So, and it sounded like this, just to make it short. This is a different computer from Philips, but they had a record. So. This is one sort of calculation. There are like five or six of those recordings. And then also gladly for me as a, a historian or former historian, there was like an article very precisely describing the process of the um, generation of that sound you can hear. And here is the algorithm. It's an algorithm uh, to calculate uh, prime numbers, whether a big number is a prime number or not. And actually, yeah, so this is producing the sound. And then also you could uh, think about what goes into the algorithms. Maybe the algorithms is also listening to, not listening, but listening in a metaphorical way to numbers and they get kind of processed. So this sounds like that. Oops. Hmm. can follow here the, it's like a score, and this is the prime number. Now it's finding out the prime number because it takes a long time. Okay, so this is kind of historical work. I did, and also I tried to do similar things, uh, question if similar things are now that's possible, and indeed it's possible. So I did this with, uh, with uh, magnetic coils, and you can listen to the electromagnetic emission. You can do that with mobile phones also. Maybe the video is broken. Uh, yeah, anyway, so you can imagine. Also, you can do it hardware-based, uh, software-based. I tried to sonify uh, just very simple algorithms, so, um, sorting algorithms. Um, this is bubble sort, it's a very stupid one.
and that the point is now you can compare it with merge sort, for example, and then you will see that it really behaves different. So. Okay. So as you know, yeah, you can read this in more detail in some of these publications, and um, maybe you have many open questions. But <clears throat> I would like to work out a bit one remaining open question a bit, which is uh, why did this uh, listening practice of this in the in the 50s and and 60s uh, suddenly disappear? So which brings me to the operator and again to this picture. So. I, the argument I developed in some of the briefly, briefly shown uh, publications is that listening practices disappeared due to the emergence of operating systems in the 1960s. So crucial machine um, operator knowledge got then kind of embodied into the operating system. And this is some kind of a reversal between listening to a machine and the machine being able to listen to, to itself and also um, yeah, the possibility of listening to machine led then also to machines listening, you could say. So this historical, if you look at such processes of re reversals, you have similar processes in telegraphy in the 1920s, automated uh, telegraph machines, telephony in the 1940s with switching machinery, the telephone operator who was, yeah, you need to talk to and the, the call the number got this um, replaced with switching machinery and then also with computation. And maybe you could look at more advanced replacements such as uh, sonar operators or eavesdroppers. Uh, and maybe also if you would further kind of see a <coughs> linear development of that if you want, uh, you can also see like other diff um, replacements like, you know, like we talked uh, just before, like ornithologists, maybe they, they got replaced, or uh, musicologists or historians. But also, if you look at it a little bit from a different angle, there are also many fields where epistemic listening skills are still used, such as uh, medical auscultation, uh, using the stethoscope, uh, which is a very fast and simple um, method for medical di uh, diagnostics. Also, like um, in in Japan, people use um, their ear uh, for looking at the uh, water and the canalization or listening to the canalization. Also, you can just uh, put, um, beat on a cheese and check if it's ripe or not. Right. So this is a this is a question of um, how much effort and um, energy you put into this transformation process. Okay, so I think that's my point. Yeah, that's, thanks. I've taken the problem of humanizing algorithmic listening as literally as I could, <laughs> uh, which has encouraged me to be kind of speculative for this talk because I think it's an impossible problem. Uh, I think that machine listening is quite a sort of faulty leaky metaphor for what we do as humans when we listen. Um, but I think that's encouraging rather than discouraging. It, it's going to make us try and think about what we can do to change how we think about machine listening. Um, so I'm a musician and a kind of music sociologist, I guess. Uh, so my insights are skewed towards the methodology of studying music as a living practice. And the kinds of questions I've occupied myself with uh, well, my practice is using autonomous tools to make music, basically, and the question I'm thinking about at the moment is how do we write music sociology when we have tools which make music without me necessarily playing them like I would a violin? Um, and I've got three kind of points I want to, or three kind of ruptures I want to open up uh, in thinking about how we might humanize algorithmic listening. Uh, and they come from quite a broad spectrum of positions. Um, so the particular hill I've chosen to die on is holding a position which Owen kind of, I think quite elegantly described in a previous conference as being a reformulated humanist. Do you remember that? Yeah, unreconstructed, I thought. <laughs> unreconstructed or whatever it was. Uh, and I'm trying to give my own specific twist on this position uh, to kind of build up Owen's beef with computational approaches 
but expanding that much further uh, in both cognition and sociology. Two fields where machinic metaphors of intentional human behavior interact with and feed back into our theorizations of what it means to be human. By this, I'm referring to as what I treat as one of the foundational operating assumptions of my work, that of the performativity of method, which put simply states how the material and discursive are intricately intertwined, which as John Law puts it, that in surprising and contradictory ways, our methods seem to create the worlds which they purport to describe. My implication here is that a description of a complex black box or set of black boxes as performing some creative or intentional behavior in everyday practice is never simply a description. And it's worth examining the precise mechanisms through which any given set of algorithms comes to stand for intentional human behaviors like improvising, composing, or even listening. As for some time now, objects which ex exhibit some form of autonomous intentional behavior have played an increasingly large role in the public consciousness. And it's those devices which deftly operate in the cultural sectors, performing those most quintessentially human activities, from playing games to writing fiction, which are the most attention-grabbing of all. And this public-facing aspect of cultural automatons is worth careful consideration on two consecutive fronts, I think. Uh, firstly, in how it shapes the public discourse around the nature of autonomous objects, how we construct popular ideas of what it is these objects do, independent of specialist knowledge and detailed technical descriptions. And secondly, how this material discursive covenant reflects the broader dynamics of science arts and the increasing role the arts play in mediating publicly funded scientific research to the general public. As computational techniques don't just offer opportunities for new knowledge, rather they construct our very ideas of what academic knowledge is, something which I think has been like, readily apparent from the talks this morning. <clears throat> uh, and this is something which Gary Hall has pointed out, and that there's a danger that the computational turn is kind of being collapsed into the entire description of what the digital humanities are. <clears throat> um, and in a short essay, Beyond the Dig uh, Digital Humanities Beyond Computing, is really excellent in questioning quite how much the humanities need to draw from computational methods to define itself and that perhaps computer science is not all that well equipped to understand itself and its own founding object, the computer, let alone help the humanities with their relation to computing and the digital. As it seems, the traffic between the humanities and computing has been very unidirectional, and it's worth investigating what a digital humanities might look like that can extend beyond the disciplinary objects, working assumptions, and methodologies of computer science. Um, so I'm going to leave those kind of disciplinary anxieties about our methodology just kind of hanging and move on to my sort of three uh, questions around the usefulness of the metaphor of machine listening and to suggest that kind of crucially what gets left behind through computational approaches is how meaning is attached to or conveyed by music and sound more broadly. So my first point I'm going to skip over a load of kind of theoretical background and point to my friend and colleague, Juan Loaiza's exhaustive and comprehensive work tying together the inactive approach to cognition and new musicology. Uh, to quickly summarize, the inactive approach is broadly defined in opposition to computational Cartesian dualist conceptions of the mind, where embodiment needs to be articulated with other core concepts such as organismic autonomy, sense-making, emergence, experience, and the self-organization of multi-agent interactions that give form to social life. And the important point to take away from musicology, uh, new musicology for the purpose of this talk is to say that meaning is conveyed by and attached to music through its articulation in social life. That content alone cannot bear the explanatory weight for how any given collection of sounds becomes meaningful, but rather meaning arises through the rich interactions of traditions, emotions, codes, rituals, practices, and sounds across multiple timescales. Music is best understood by understanding the relationships it creates, the various entanglements of humans and objects around sounds. And what I'm trying to allude to briefly here is the deep asymmetries between the processes of human and machine listening. That human listening is irreducible to the sound, ear, and brain, and that by simply adding complexity to the functional representational models of machine listening only serves to deepen those asymmetries. Uh, so this is my first kind of suggestion for how we might humanize algorithmic listening, is to make it multi-scale. Um, and that 
context is not simply just like a cherry on top that can add some flavor to the content which is in itself meaningful, but content is always mediated in a complex feedback loop with its environment. And like ideally we would get rid of those, that dichotomy entirely, um, that context, I'm using context to kind of speak to, as the world out there and music is the thing which is in here. But these two things are inseparable and to reduce it to either one, you lose kind of the human. <laughs> Um, my second point is that, very broadly speaking, there's been two approaches to technology in the philosophy of technology. First is instrumental, treating technologies as tools which we use to we manipulate towards some ends. Uh, the second approach, which someone mentioned, Stiegler, just now, is uh, originary technicity, which treats technologies as that which is directly constitutive of what it means to be human, that technologies construct and change our cognitive apparatus. But it seems that often there's a temporal trajectory to how we conceive our relationships with technologies. With new technologies, more often than not, it seems that the questions surrounding them are instrumental in nature. Like, what can we do with this new thing? Like, how can it help me? What does it do? Um, rather than thinking about how they constitute what we think of as knowledge. Um, it's only after the fact, when these kind of wild innovations find some stability, uh, that technologies become opaque. Um, and these are when the questions of origin techni technicity kind of get floated. Um, I'm gonna, I've got way too much stuff. <laughs> I think this is, okay, my second point then of how to make, how to humanize algorithmic listening is to make it reflexive, to question how it constructs our concepts of our own behaviors and to resist fixed implementations, to keep things messy, open and fragile, forefront the fragility of machine listening algorithms. They're such like weird floppy things that are so unpredictable and often require really precise conditions to make viable. Forefront the fragility and forefront the conditions that make them possible in the first place. Resist implementation. Um, artists are already doing this, like David's Kant's work and Owen's kind of stuff is really good examples of that. Um, so change our attitude. Instead of thinking of the strange behaviors as anomalous, think of them as the default state of machine listening. Um, default states which can then Become, and often do become reified to identify patterns and kind of prove points which have already been made. Um, my third point, I guess I don't really have much time for. You've got 40 seconds, go on. <laughs> third point <laughs> is about uh, group making practices and categorization, kind of follows on from the second one. Um, I was going to draw from Actor Network, that you're making me not talk about Latour here. <laughs> so everyone will be thankful here. Yeah. Uh, so the third point is about. Uh, group making practices are always steeped in contra controversy. When we're out in the world, one of the first things we kind of notice is that we're being pulled in so many different directions to be put in different groups. You already kind of made this point. All I'm saying is make machine listening algorithms argue about if a track is deep house or something or not. Keep our categories controversial and fluid and changing. And I'll leave it at that. Brilliant. Bang on time. Um, this is the question that I'm a question that I'm interested in. I have many interests that are relevant to this network, but I decided to focus on this one today. We can talk about other interests I have. Um, so I don't mean to imply by asking this that no one has yet got a robot to sing. Maybe they have, but I, as I still think considering the question, uh, what would it be what, if, if there are singing robots now? Um, what, why are they singing robots? What is it that makes them singing? And I think I have interests in that question. Well, I have interest in that question both, well, <laughs> from uh, a philosophical perspective, but also a practical AI perspective, and as a, a cognitive scientist, trying to use the insights from the first two to maybe understand aspects of our own um, performance and other kinds of cognition. Um, so I think in order to answer the question, what would it be for a robot to sing? It seems to me, at least I have to get clear on what is it to sing? in a theoretical sense. Of course, we all have an idea in some more pragmatic sense of what it is to sing. But I don't think it's about reproducing the kinds of acoustic signals that humans um, produce. Um, that's not sufficient for singing and it's not even necessary as consider the case of birdsong, if that's a case of singing, which I think it is. Um, so I'll just jump to what I, the working hypothesis now is that singing is a kind of embodied dynamic musical performance. And we can contrast it, and it's traditionally contrasted with uh, instrumental 
musical performance, um, but I will instead be focusing on the similarities between instrumental musical performance and singing. Um, so for one thing, maybe that contrast isn't really available for robots, given that they don't have a, a real body in the sense that we do. There can't be a contrast between making sounds with the body versus using some tool. Um, maybe they only have tools, maybe they only, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how this relates to um, the exosomatic uh, organ concept, but I'm sure it does. Um, um, and then I'm going to also ignore the constraint that singing is music, musical. Um, I just can't address everything here. So I'm just going to focus on performance, embodied dynamic performance. Um, so really, in a way, I'm just asking, what would it be for a robot to have a voice? But putting it that way would be misleading, because people think they already have an answer to that question because of the overemphasis on the linguistic case. And um, we're trying to get away from that particular emphasis, I think, in this network. So I think it's best to keep it back uh, with singing. So by embodied dynamic musical performance, I mean to contrast, for example, uh, actual robot singing with something like on stage sending a WAV file to a digital to analog converter. That is the paradigmatic case of not a robot singing, uh, it, according to uh, the, the way I'm investigating this issue. I don't, I don't mean to criticize that. It, I'm sure it can have a valid, it could even be play a valid role as singing in certain, uh, especially artistic contexts, but that's just not the, the, the area, that's not the kind of singing I'm interested in. Um, why not? Well, I think essential to the notion of the kind of singing I'm interested in understanding is that the outcome should be uncertain. There, it isn't, uh, a tight, there isn't a tight link between the parameters of the sound generation and the outcome. So in fact, the outcome may, may fail to conform to some kind of intended outcome. And that gap, I think, is characteristic of performance in general, what we call um, human performance. Um, not that some, you know, there might be certain individuals at certain times for whom that gap shrinks to near zero or zero, but that's understood against a background of possibility of failing to meet an intended goal or, um, or divergence from an intention, which might not be considered a failure, but might be considered synergistic or, or, for, or fortunate. In particular, singing is non-ballistic. It's not like a pressing a piano key. Uh, there's, uh, there's an ongoing modulation, an ongoing control of the, um, of the activity. And that's related to the, it being a performance rather than just sending a WAV file to a DAC. And that kind of ongoing control requires responding to feedback. And in this case, and that's a kind of um, uh, important dynamics of responding, the, the, the thing that's making an action or generating a sound, responding to, I'm not gonna say the environment because in this case I'm focusing on listening to oneself. So one, it, a key aspect of singing is hearing oneself and changing one's, um, voice, one's voice and one's output, if you want, want to call it that, um, as a result of that feedback. So it's listening, but the special case of listening to oneself. Um, because, you know, all music making, you could, you could say, or generally speaking, is, is involves, a, especially with, when you're performing with others, involves a kind of listening, listening to make sure you're coming in at the right time or that you're maintaining tempo or your intonation is correct. But I mean this kind of listening to oneself as a way of generating the, uh, the sound in, in a way that is also um, shared with in certain kinds of instrumental performance, like you know, playing a violin, constant listening, constant modulation of motor, motor control in order to um, achieve a particular goal. Um, so the two kinds of listening or feedback uh, that one can use in order to do this kind of embodied dynamic performance, um, one is real-time feedback. You can listen to the output of your voice or whatever it is, you, however you're generating sound, and you can compare that, say, to some kind of uh, intended, or you can evaluate it and say, is, do I like that, do I not like that? Is that what I had in mind? Is it not what I had in mind? And you can and adjust. And that's, in some sense, more ideal than, uh, it's more pure than the, ki than the other kind of, um, listening I'm going to mention, but it's also too late. It's after the, after the event, it's post, it's, you know, you've already made that sound, you're responding to it, but 
it's now too late to go back and unmake that sound, at least in any direct sense. But there's also virtual listening, and I'm, I'm getting, I'm borrowing, well, I'm using ideas that have also been applied in the case of um, motor, motor control for, say, reaching behavior. There, we, we found that uh, the way that we get smooth reaching behavior is by getting feedback not from the world, because that would be too late, but we get feedback from emulator circuits, forward models that we have of how we expect the visual and proprioceptive signals to change as we engage in an activity. So we're simulating the world at a faster rate than the world. We're simulating ourselves at a faster rate than we're actually acting. And we use that simulated behavior in order to guide our, to tell us whether or not we are doing well. And so we use these internally generated pseudo virtual feedback signals uh, as a way to guide our performance. Now that does require real listening, not just this virtual listening, but the, the kind of listening in, in, in approach one in order to learn those models. But in the online moment of performance, yes, there might be this, but there's also um, this kind of virtually, virtually guided listening feedback that to, um, con to add to your control <coughs> of your performance. So um, here's an idea of how you can, say, give a robot this, this type of ability. You could have the f approach one would just be you have some kind of idea of what kind of sound you want to create, and you have some kind of um, system that can create sounds, and you, you create a sound, and you compare the created sound to the intended sound, and any differences between them can uh, go back and affect your future performance. But there's also this virtual listening approach where you have this forward model, this prediction of what uh, will happen if you continue doing what you're doing. And you can compare that to what you would like to happen or your intended uh, sonic performance. And that can constrain what it is you're going to, the sounds you're going to make and change parameters there even before you've got to that part of the actual performance. So that's the kind of thing. Um, I'm talking about here, and that is essentially using listening. Uh, listening is used in order to generate the model. K listening to oneself is used in order to generate the model, in addition to listening being used to provide um, after-the-fact feedback. Uh, finally, my last slide is that um, I, I have interests beyond uh, this, these kinds of um, its emphasis on synthesis and creation of sound. In general, I'm interested in machine models of consciousness or conscious experience. And a particular proposal that relates to this network is that the, uh, I do think there is a role for content in explaining, uh, in explaining cognition and experience. So the content of experience is at least partly determined by the content of our expectations that are manifested in the kinds of forward models that I was describing before in these emulator circuits and other kinds of forward models. And um, that there, for those of you who know what predictive coding models are, that it's, it's similar to that, but distinct from that, and it predates them. But also, I, um, to talk about something that's actually been done rather than something that I'd like to do, um, some of my work is focused on how we can better understand the function of consciousness by understanding unconscious auditory and visual processing. So in collaboration with some psychologists here at Sussex, we found that um, cross-modal associations, that's say audio to visual associations, can be learned even when neither the audio, audio stimulus nor the visual stimulus are consciously experienced. And that was a rather surprising novel result that hadn't been established before, that you can actually learn an association between a sound um, that you actually don't perceive. You don't hear, you ask the subject, did you hear anything? Did you hear any music? They say no. And uh, you give them a visual pattern uh, as well, and they, you ask them if they saw anything, they say no. But nevertheless, we can show that in their behavior later that they did associate that sound with that visual pattern. Um, so it's a kind of uh, unconscious um, listening that might be uh, the kind of analog more analogous to what's going on with current kinds of machine listening and the difference between actual um, conscious listening um, might, in, in, human, in the human case, might suggest directions we could take for uh, algorithmic machine listening. Thank you for listening, and I just want to uh, mention that, oop, this work is based on discussions I've had with um, 
Evelyn and uh, Ed here in the music department. And, and I don't know why the screen keeps going on. <laughs> okay. Uh, and also uh, thanks to the rest of you who, out there who have, I've talked, that I've talked to about this. Thank you. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I am to engage with this question. What does it mean to listen with or through machines? So they are already listening. And I should say from the beginning, they approach this question as a re-articulation of another question. What does it mean to think with or through machines they are already thinking? I've been studying the <laughs> philosophical implications of the computational automation of thought for some time now, so it's perhaps in part inevitable that I will approach the question of listening from the perspective of the question of thinking. But I'm doing this in the specific context of today's event, also because I believe that to ask whether an algorithm is listening, or conversely, whether a machine is thinking, involves similar issues. Both questions demand us to move beyond the anthropomorphism that is implicit in expressions such as listening algorithms or thinking machines. This is because, in my opinion, when we think with or through machines that are already thinking, or when we listen with or through machines that are already listening, we are also listening and thinking alongside them. So my aim today is to stress the sense in which these machines can be said to be operating alongside us on the manner in which they function both in proximity to us, but also in autonomy from us. Very broadly speaking, to anthropomorphize means to ascribe human characteristics to non-human entities. And we know this is a guilty pleasure of ancient and modern civilization alike. For ancient means of talking animals and demigods will fall in and out of love, there is a modern tale of rabbits who are running late or tank engines with big smiles and big eyes. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear to note that anthropomorphism seems to always involve a form of projection. Famously, this point was made by the philosopher Ludwig Andreas von Feuerbach, and before him, also by Baruch Spinoza, and by the Greeks. The Greeks said it all already, Xenophanes and Plato. For them, anthropomorphism reveals that humans do ponder about many things, and in doing so, they project their own inward attributes outside themselves. In this projection, however, they also get acquainted with who they are. So whilst looking at these past accounts and critiques of anthropomorphism, we must, of course, avoid drawing too strict of a parallel between very different contexts and scope. In Feuerbach's case, this guy on my left, on my right there, uh, for example, his aim was to expose what he called the anthropological essence of religion. Much more modestly today, in this talk I challenge the anthropomorphization of technology to argue that when we apply phenomenological analogies to machine agents, so for instance when we say that machines listen or think or read, we are implicitly projecting specific human definitions of cognitive activities upon operation that are in fact incommensurable with us. In both cases, however, anthropomorphic representations reveal more about human beings than about the entity that we attribute human characteristics to. In both cases, anthropomorphism reflects, instead, a desire for humans to be free or recognize themselves as free from their own limitations. Technoculture often responded to this wish to break free from limitations with promises of augmentation. So today I would like to propose to you that there is a link between our anthropomorphizing willingness to talk of algorithms that supposedly listen or think, and the way in which we might extend or exteriorize predetermined forms of behavior through augmentation. To augment is to boost, to add on, to enlarge, to expand, to inflate. According to a logic of augmentation, when soldiers could not hear the enemy, we build them bigger ears so they could do so. In a similar spirit, our techno years became even bigger when we came for listen, where we came to listen for life in the universe. To augment then is to overcome boundaries. If our bodies are finite, we use technologies to make them less so. Arguably, a rhetoric of augmentation has always been part of cultural discourses about technology. So from this perspective, technical issues concerning human-machine announcement are also linked to philosophical questions regarding the prosthetic or assemblage-like role of technology. On this topic, cognitive science also crosses with the humanities, what is known 
as the theory of the extended mind, which has been mentioned today, for instance, describe mental processes as spready beyond the limits of the perceiving organism to encompass the many tools that we use in everyday cognitive functions and, and activities. So today nothing, we know, perhaps exemplifies this cognitive hypothesis better than the many calendars and notes and reminders to busy our smartphone and laptops. Interesting here, the big technology player will seem to agree with this view. Google, for instance, wants to be explicitly a third half of your brain. This was said by Sergey Brin in an interview some time ago. So the possibility of extending, exteriorizing human cognition and the social exercise of the role are of central importance to the political economy of Silicon Valley. Social media, phone apps, networking platform, design interfaces, smart devices, and the industry of things. The industry markets these technologies as helpful assistants, as instruments, in fact, through which we can offload and outsource the chore of identifying and retaining relevant information, thus allowing us to dedicate our finite time and our finite mental efforts to other things. According to the view, this view is serious listening. Why should we do so too? So there's, of course, much more to say here, and time is very limited. So I will just add the intermeshing of human co and algorithmic modes of listening, just like the intermeshing of human and algorithmic modes of thinking, require us to consider how the ontologies and the epistemology of technoscience are never neutral, but in fact often very normative and ideological, insofar they impose upon society and culture specific assumptions and understandings of what accounts for cognitive or perceptual activity. In my view, it's precisely when we do so, when we consider what accounts for a cognitive or perceptual activity, that our rhetoric of argumentation reveals itself to be limited, too limited to be applied to computation. Despite the fact that this rhetoric will seem to be characterized by the information industry and also some of the humanities' response to digital transformation, I will argue that contemporary developments in computational automation ask us instead to consider how artificial cognitive agents can no longer be described in terms of technological add-ons to human cognitive capacities. So, of course, this is in part a consequence of the scale and speeds of this automation. However, for me, this is also due to the highly formalized and formalizing character of computation and, moreover, to its algorithmic nature. So with computational automation, we have machines that augment us in our research. Machines that help us to read more, search more, hear more, and to do so harder, better, faster, stronger. On top of this augmentation, however, with computational automation, we are also mechanizing the execution of rules. And with that, the actualization of novel forms of decision making. They have a degree of both epistemic and ontological autonomy from us. So, my argument here is that automated computational agents work on a different order of intelligibility and that they also propose different modes of sensibility. So I'm going quickly, very quickly, because I see there's only two minutes, <laughs> to address the case of machine learning in order to expand on this point. I don't need to say to this audience what machine learning is, but just very quickly, it's a type of artificial intelligence that endows computers with the capacity to learn from large data set. And this technique has been enlarged uh, talked about today because it lies, at the basis, it, it, it lies at the basis of many promising developments. What I'd like to consider today that along with this excitement comes a caveat. It's often said the machine learning is a black box. And that's my picture of a black box. In other words, he stressed that although these algorithms have a great impact upon society, they cannot be held accountable for the consequence of this impact because they are proprietary and thus close to public scrutiny. Of course, I agree that deciphering the black boxes of, human, of machine learning is becoming more, more and more urgent because their influence upon our world is becoming greater and greater every day. The point that I would like to consider with you today, however, is that machine learning is also a black box in another, more technical sense. Because they are modeled to act as deep neural nets, these techniques are often very opaque or indeed illegible because too complex to be understood also by the very same programmers that created them. Machine learning works, but we don't fully understand how. The claim that we don't know what they, how they work is for me profoundly interesting, and so far it's my allows us to say that, de facto, machine learning is making a crack into the simulative paradigm that's looming over AI research since Turing imitation game in 1950. 
Of course, to an extent, we can say that these algorithms learn learn because they improve themselves based on the exposure to stimuli. In reality, however, we cannot judge this improvement of this supposed learning according to parameters of simulated behavior, precisely because we cannot really tell what's going on. So in this sense, the 2016 Go victory of Google DeepMind machine learning system AlphaGo reveals what we should have already been made aware by the chess victory of the older and more mundane IBM's machine Deep Blue in 1997. Both computational successes show that these agents win not because they think or behave like us, rather they win because they think or behave in a manner that's completely, dif uh, that's completely different to the way in which we think or behave. So to conclude, I think that the trope here is not that of the cyborg, which can be anthropomorphized or humanized because it embeds the augmentation, replication, and extension of cognitive faculties, and this still projects a human form. Rather, for me, the trope here is that of the alien, something that was profound alterity is irreconcilable with any attempt to give it, it a human shape or destiny. I know that to an extent, the limits of our language will always be the limits of our world. And perhaps we're also bound to relate to what we cannot understand with metaphors and analogies from our experience. Just once, once upon a time, we thought that a, standard tom, a thunderstorm meant the sky was angry. The challenge for me, however, the challenge for philosophy, and more specifically for the philosophical study of computational automation that will come, is to try as best as we can to come to grips, this is the technical term, with these alien orders of intelligibility and sensibility the automated computational agents represent. In my view, and I leave it as an open question, this for me involves moving from the strictly phenomenological to the speculative, and precisely using the speculative to address the analytic and critical prospect of understanding what an epistemic and ontological autonomy of listening or thinking alike may be within the rule-based space of computation. Thank you. I've never done anything officially with sound uh, or with archiving or digital humanities or anything. Although I have to tell my father is an archiv archivist, but, uh, so he ordered and indexed old papers of the city and helped people with their genealogical uh, investigations about their family history. And um, uh, I... I also know, yeah, it's a personal hobby of me to, to, to have an interest in music. For example, I'm a, I'm a huge admirer of Frank Zappa, and he has a, <laughs> he has, he happened, he appears to have a vault, enormous. So he has a vault meister, who is now uh, every every now and then there's a new uh, album of uh, old materials, etc. Um, just two weeks ago, I read a piece in some kind of catalogue about uh, Edgar Varese and Xenaxis working in the Philips Pavilion with mm -hmm. Philips people. So there's, there's a lot of, yeah, there is connections. Um, I work in Enschede, that's in the eastern part of the Netherlands, at the, now at a school for professional education, uh, University of Applied Sciences, I saw the word before. Uh, but I was uh, trained at the University of Twente there, and they have a, yeah, an extensive group of, that works in philosophy of technology and science, but focusing really on philosophy of technology. Um, yeah, it was hard to <coughs> choose uh, what I would bring here. And uh, I'm also really interested to, to hear something of you. This, so I won't, uh, I like to be, uh, 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 interventions uh, are allowed, let's say that. Um, so first of all, why did I accept to come? Not because my father was archivist, <laughs> but the, the, the listening to, uh, no, humanizing algorithmic listening. That yeah, attracted my, uh, uh, me. And that's because um, I have these days especially an interest in, let's say, humanizing algorithms. So algorithms, machine learning, it's popping up everywhere. And it's interesting from a philosophical and also ethical point of view. Um, and I, in the end of the presentation, I will use a concept of Michel Foucault. I actually always was interested in his late work, but this is from his first work, work and it's an anthropological sleep. Uh, and then the listening part. So I'm interested in how humans interact with technology, how technology uh, becomes part of them, hybridization, etc. But I've never focused on sound, but always more on vision and touch. 
So I thought this is a good occasion to add sound to that. And um, yeah, in this respect, I'm, I will, I'm interested. Of all, I was, yeah, I really like uh, McLuhan with his sense ratios, etc. You know all that. Um, and also Willem Flusser, is he known here? I really admire his work. And, um, and then I thought, hey, I know about Don Eide, who uh, reissued a book that he wrote in the, in the beginning of the 70s, and it's about listening and voice. I never read it, but it's, it's interesting, I think. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, well, I, I do know quite a lot about uh, the work of Don Eide, a philosopher of technology, but not this early work of his. Uh, it's a phenomenology of listening, and I think that, that he says, with listening comes that you be, are being called. And it's something else than analyzing and structuring text, etc. But now, uh, I want to show you the next five minutes or so uh, what I made of this, how I use this interest in the sense ratios, etc., and um, in philosophy of technology. And that's uh, what I've called product impact tool. And that's my way. So, uh, um, and it looks like this. It's a diagram that's part of my PhD thesis, and it's an attempt to bring to an audience like this a lot of work in philosophy of technology, and, but also in design, psychology, so interdisciplinary, and pick some um, useful concepts, and even more important, the best examples. Uh, and that's a way to, yeah, to, to collect a, a work for in, uh, in from a very broad, uh, uh, background uh, and to, to use it. So and you will find back a little bit of Flusser and McLuhan here because the, there are 12 impacts that technology can have. It's a categorization. You could have another categorization, but this is mine. It's well thought, but it's just one categorization. And then uh, it's yeah, based a little bit on the work from media studies and phenomenology, and that's, you see that in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the quadrant. So it has before the eye. When I made this, I was really interested in how can technology change your behavior, influence us, and how can you use that? So then the question is, if technology can have, has an impact on you, from which side does it come? That's the model. So it can influence your decisions. A lot of then conscious cognition is involved. That's before the eye. The eye is there, the symbol. Uh, and the hand is the symbol for more physical interaction. Uh, technology can coerce you. And then behind the back, the brackets, the back is then the symbol here for the wider environment. That, that, yeah, that technology marks and influences what you do, but you do not have direct form of interaction with it. And above the head is the place for more general evaluations. So it's ideas. And the, the cloud is there, the symbol. Um, then it's a website, and if it's... Um, and I will just show you how that works. Um, so you saw a diagram, but if you are at home and you like it, you can, and, and I'm not there, you can try to, you can look back at it and here is a little bit of explanation. But as I told you, I, I like the examples most. So therefore in the outer circle is in total, I think 60 examples. So before the eye, there I distinguish that technologies can just guide you to the correct way of using them, but they can also persuade you to change your behavior. And there's another kind of, another concept that's well known, and that's image. Do you want to identify with a certain technology or not so much? Uh, now I'll show you some pictures. This is my remote control. It does a bad job. In, in showing you how to use it. So, well, there's not so much time, but you can see how it works. There are 60 examples. And there's not so many examples uh, where sound is involved. Uh, but there's one. Uh, let's see, where is it? So I, in the more physical relation to technology, I also have subliminal effect. And there's an example. This is a British invention, the mosquito. You know it? Yeah. So we're, <laughs> we thank you for that. <laughs> now, yeah, it's for, to ward off loitering teens, for example. Um, 
So, and I have also tried a little bit to find more examples in the, uh, uh, relating to sound, but there's not so much time for it. But of course, you can see that not all kind of notifications give you, uh, uh, give you directions. Um, but I also try to think of uh, in the in the in, the, in more in in the style of uh, McLuhan and Flusser about uh, what this interest in listening and voice means, and then you could say, but I will just give the words to you that uh, this a comeback of orality. It might make writing obsolete, but then Flusser would say, yeah, it brings back orality, but over the top of a kind of hidden codification or code. So it's not really the old orality, but a new one. And that brings us uh, to the, my last uh, minute. I want to switch back now. So this was for in case the website wouldn't work. Uh, this is a picture of my PhD thesis. Um, and there, it, this, this model is part of a research into technical mediation and subjectivation. Um, but there's not so much time here. I can only just show it. Philosophy of technology we do, but the term technical mediation has become very much important. Um, and here I've chosen as a title, uh, what brings technology and sound together is that uh, uh, it matters uh, if we are being he heard and remembered. Um, but there's not so much time for this. Here, I, can, I have the time to bring up Latour, <laughs> at least his picture. Latour is one of the people who uh, talked about technical mediation, but there are others. And uh, my supervisor, a colleague and friend, uh, Peter Paul Verbeek, uh, tries to draw really a theory of technical mediation to put this into a kind of a framework. And my model is one version of such a framework. Um, but I actually like to do it in a more cultural, philosophical and more hermeneutical way, uh, where he talks about what things do. I like actually to talk about what we think that think that things do to us. That's, I think I want to bring back a little bit more hermeneutics into that. Uh, but it's not so much time. I go further. Um, um, yeah, this, uh, now, to end this. About being heard and remembered. What is uh, about technical mediation and uh, what it means to be human? Well, there is this book of a colleague also from Twente René Munnik, in Dutch, it's Time Machines. And he talks about uh, phonography and all kinds of these, uh, these, these kinds of technologies. And just like Stiegler, he uh, uh, really thinks that these are important for human culture. And he notes that all these technologies have as a, one, one of the aspects is that they are means to conquer death. Uh, that an, uh, our speech can uh, yeah, can be remembered. Um, but in the book is a very interesting argument that most of the time we expect too much of it. It has a little bit to do with what you uh, said, just said. Re some people really have a kind of a utopian project that by uh, uh, remembering everything that we will attain a kind of eternal life. But it's impossible. And uh, yeah, to, to, to say it in only one sentence, that's probably because yeah, we, in, in, in a way, we can get other times to us. But it's not the same as that we can go to all the other times as well. Huh? It's, impo it's impossible for us to go there. Um, so that was about eternal life, a kind of utopian expectations. And now the, uh, the other side, a more uh, of a, a dystopian view, or more in a, in a framework of a dystopian view, and uh, the... I, I play a little bit with a notion by Michel Foucault. So life goes on mute if we don't, if you don't, if you're not careful with all this kind of machine learning and uh, algorithms. Uh, and that has to do a little bit with the with the idea that that maybe machines can understand us and uh, interaction via speech and so etc. can become very important for the way we interact with technologies and we are in the world. But then, do we really find, feel understood by all these technologies? That's another question. Um, yeah. So in, in Les Mots et Les Shows, the, the Order of Things by Foucault, there's an idea that since the Enlightenment, uh, our own thinking and science have become very much important. And that's the end of a dogmatic slumber. 
that's instead of kind of mythological, uh, religious, etc. speculation, we now have real knowledge. Uh, so that's, we are out of that slumber, but Foucault warns that not long afterwards, because of a positivistic way of doing science, we may fall into another sleep, and that's the sleep that we end being human, that uh, our life goes on mute, and that he calls the anthropological sleep. Um, yeah, his answer would be that freedom is a little bit more uh, uh, complex, and it's an undefined work, and that's maybe enigmatic, but still it should be the end for this small talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you.